We have a word for this year. It's a year of unprecedented harvest. And we're going to speak tonight about Gideon, unprecedented victory. Now this word we have, unprecedented harvest, we're still working through it. And right now, I'm believing for a divine strategy. Here's what I mean by that. Within the next six months to a year, COVID is going to go by the wayside. All right? And people are going to return to life. And they are going to be hungry to return to life. And they are going to want to do stuff. They're going to want to be with people. We are on the verge at some point in our foreseeable year of normalcy. Okay? It's coming. And when it does, I want to have a divine strategy from heaven to make sure that we're doing everything we can to engage our community. Does that make sense? And what I mean, what do you mean, Pastor, by divine strategy? Well, take Billy Graham, for instance. Now, we know Billy Graham, and it's a, the Billy Graham we knew is the old Billy Graham. But most of us are not old enough to remember Billy Graham when he was the young Billy Graham. And when we study the young Billy Graham, he was ahead of his time. He was the first person on TV. He was preaching on TV. He was using video to reach teenagers. He, he was one of the fathers of modern-day youth ministry. He's the one who said, we've got to reach the kids. And when he began to do those things, he received a lot of criticism from the church. Oral Roberts got the revelation of divine healing. He began to he lay hands on the sick, and they recovered. And he received a lot of criticism from the church, but he won millions of people to Jesus Christ. Uh, full gospel businessmen, simply dinner meetings, invite your friends to a dinner at a restaurant. We're going to have a speaker, a testimony. Hundreds of thousands get saved. Promise keepers, let's get men together and talk about honesty and integrity and loving our wives and our children. And let's do it in a way that appeals to men. How many of y'all know men don't like to be led by sissy men? Men want to be led by men. So let's, let's have things like sports and hunting, and let's be manly about it. And it touched millions of people. Carmen, let's not just sing. Let's, let's tell a story with what we're singing, and let's put it to drama. Let's put it to video. Touched millions of people. I could go on. And I believe every generation has a divine strategy. There is a key. And ladies and gentlemen, I, I know you're, you're sitting looking at me tonight like, okay, so what? I, I, need you to, to, I need you to hook your faith up with my faith. I, I need you to have faith with me and me with you because we're called not to come be the frozen chosen. We're called not to be us four and no more. We're not called simply to come together and, and talk about what God can't do, won't do. We're here to be the church and to take the message of salvation to our community. We have to be Jesus to our community. Amen. Amen. We don't have a choice on that. And so I, I need you. I need you. I need you to be praying over the next few weeks and months and saying, Lord, give us our community. Lord, give us our young people. Lord, give us our elderly people. Lord, give us this young generation. Lord, give us anyone who is not born again. Give us the opportunity to share Christ with them in this community before they go home. Amen. And there's a way we can do that better than we've ever done it before. We just have to lay hold of it. Amen. Does that make sense? All right, so I'm asking your agreement with me. I'm asking your faith with me. Because I, 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 I know everybody's talking, people are talking, oh, I can't wait till COVID's over. I want to go to a sporting event again. I want to go to a concert again. 
I want to hear, I, I, that might be what they, they they're, they're desiring to do something, but what they don't know is they need Jesus. And we got to find a way to help them connect those dots. All right. And one of the things the Lord has given me for this year is, it's going to be a Gideon year. It's a year of unprecedented harvest, but we're going to have to do more with less because of COVID. We're going to have to do more with less. That the spirit of might is going to come upon us. So let's do, turn in our Bibles to Judges chapter 6. And I want to give you just five or six lessons tonight from Gideon. And uh, I think we're just going to go through the word. I'm going to come back and hit this again next week. Because we'll hit Genesis, Judges 6 tonight, and we'll hit Judges 7 next week. Verse 1. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years, and the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. Number one, truth number one from Gideon, from Judges chapter 6. There are consequences to our actions. Life does have consequences and rewards to it. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8 tells us, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever we sow, that we shall reap. If we sow to our flesh, we will of the flesh reap destruction. If we sow to our spirit, we will of the spirit reap everlasting life. We reap what we sow. If you look in the mirror and you don't like what you see, you are the sum total of the decisions you have made. You are, you are the, today, you are the sum total of the choices and decisions you've made every day until today. And then 10 years from now, you will be the sum total of what you see today plus the next 10 years worth of decisions. If you don't like what you see, you can't go back and change your past, but you can change your future. But we must understand, we don't like this, but God does hold us accountable. There are rewards for obedience and consequences for disobedience. Psalms 107, verse 10 and 11. Psalms 107. Those who sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, bound in affliction and irons, because they rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. Any of you men ever have to put something together on Christmas Day? I mean, you know, there is nothing worse than a toy with a thousand pieces. And then, the, well, the only thing worse than a toy with a thousand pieces is if all those pieces are wrapped tight in cellophane and twisty ties. Those things are the devil. My wife always used to say, we ought to take the people who wrap toys and put them in charge of national security. And you know, it, it's a really simple concept, guys. Nobody wants to read the directions. You got the dollhouse, you got the toy car, you got the racetrack, whatever it is. We don't need directions. And we start going. It's like, it's like when I cook. I take the whatever box, whatever it is I got on the stove, I pour it in and I throw it out. And then about five minutes later, I got to pull that box out of the trash to read the directions. Does anybody else do that besides me? Okay. It's like, man, the worst kind is those cans that pop open, you know, and then you tear that foil off. Now you can't read the directions. Bake at something. For some, we're just going to guess. But when something comes with instructions, they're not trying to torment. Well, I think some of the instructions they, they write are trying to torment us. But the idea is if you follow the instructions, you're going to get the product you desire. And if we ignore the instructions, or if we ignore Google Maps, or MapQuest, or the Rand McNally Road Atlas, we may want to go to Florida. We may end up in Alabama. There are directions, and there are directions from the Word of God. 
When God is giving us his word, the design is not to make you miserable. The design is not to be a killjoy. The design is not a bunch of rules and regulations. When God gives us his word, it's because he sees the finished product. And if you'll follow the directions, you'll get to where he's got for you to go. And there's a blessing on that. There's a blessing on the word of God. And when we deny the word of God, when we reject the word of God, when we omit the word of God, when we just simply say, I'm ignorant of the word of God, my people perish for lack of knowledge, God said. And so people sometimes are bound in affliction and change, not because God is mad at them, not because God is punishing them, they're just simply, they've neglected the directions. And it ain't working. Uh, Deuteronomy 28. I know people think of Deuteronomy. That's not very fun. I love Deuteronomy 28. Man, this is the blessing. Verse 1. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all the commandments which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the the, the, the voice of the Lord. Have you ever seen somebody overtake somebody? Maybe you're a football, like watching a game of football, and here's the running back, and the running back's going really fast, but here comes the safety, and the safety's faster, and before long that safety catches up and puts a big old tackle on him, that's being overtaken. It says if we obey the words of God, These blessings of God are going to come upon us and overtake us. You know, it is is a true thing. When you start to live for Christ and you start to turn your life around and you start to start applying the word of God, there's going to be a season where you are still eating the consequences of the decisions you had made before Christ. But as you stay on that journey, those blessings do catch up, and those blessings do overtake you. And so if you're new at this, maybe you've only been a Christian for a year or two, and maybe you were born with gener- a, into a generational cycle of poverty, a generational cycle of addiction, a generational cycle of whatever, listen, you stay with the kingdom because these blessings shall overtake you. It just takes some time. And in the next verse, next 13 verses, it lists out these blessings. And they're awesome. I mean, they are awesome. Blesses us in the city. Blesses us in the country. Blesses us going in. Blessing going out. How many of y'all know you're either going in or going out? You know, everybody's a blessing. Some people are blessing when they're coming in. Some people are blessing when they go out. Because everything you set your hand to is going to be blessed. Your finances are blessed. Your family is blessed. Your children are blessed. That's what it goes on to say. But then in verse 15, it changes the tone. It shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. So if we obey, there's blessing. If you don't, There's not blessing, consequence. And it goes on from verse 16 to 68, listing all the negative things that happen. Now, if I can do the math, verses 2 through 13, that's 12 verses. 2 through 14, that's 13 verses. Verses 16 through 68, that's 52 verses. There are 52 verses of consequence versus 13 verses of blessing. I don't know about you, but I want the blessing. Have you ever seen, I know you have, you've seen people get so wrapped up in the negative, they get so wrapped up in that life cycle of destruction, it just seems like they can't get out. Why? Because it's just spinning out of control. It's just, they're, they're operating in biblical principles without realizing it. I want us to know today, God has a plan for your life. 
And that plan is good. That plan is wonderful. That plan, he says, I, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says, Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. John 10, 10, the thief comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. God's plan for you is abundant life, but here's the instructions. Here's the instructions. And here, Galatians, now think about Judges chapter 1. I don't know why I keep calling it Galatians. Judges chapter 6, verse 1. Tells us these Jewish people, these were God's covenant people. They, they were born after Abraham. Father Abraham had many sons. You were one of them. Right arm, left. Okay. Children of Father Abraham. God had a covenant with Father Abraham. And you, all the nations of the earth, shall be blessed. I will bless those that bless you. I'll curse those that curse you. Your descendants will be like the sands of the seashore. God's favor is on the Jewish, and even today, God's favor is on the Jewish people. They, they just became a nation again in 1948. They're one of the most prosperous nations in the world. They got, they're the most technologically, technologically advanced nation in the world. And yet they weren't a country until 1948. They're this tiny, little, tiny, 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 tiny little country. Regularly attacked with terrorism, regularly attacked by multiple countries that are much bigger. They have a lot more oil than they do. And they just never learned their lesson. Don't mess with Israel. Because God's favor is on her. But even the Israelites, when they had rejected the words of God, they were not outside of the word, and they had to eat the fruit thereof. Number two, a warning. Judges chapter 6, verses 7 through 10. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel, who said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage and delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all who oppressed you, and drove them out before you and gave them their land. Also I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But you have not obeyed my voice. God desires that none should perish. Jesus came to this earth with the intent of saving every single human being born. And in his desire not to see people perish, he's put out this word, he's put out these principles, these precepts, these eternal truths, and from point one we know, if we honor these truths, we'll be blessed. If we dishonor these truths, there's going to be consequences. Well, when people begin to dishonor the truth, God loves us so much, he's not just content to let people suffer. He sends a man of God. And in this case, the prophet being spoken of was actually God himself. God himself came and spoke and said, Hey, numbskulls, the reason this is happening to you, because you've forsaken the word of God. You've forsaken the things of God. And remember, uh, if you do this, you're blessed. If you don't do the word, you're cursed. Wake up. <laughs> the key out of bondage is to repent. The key out of oppression, of, of, of circumstance, the key out of sitting in that consequential environment is repentance. The word repent simply means turn around. Every one of us has a sinful nature that is at war with our spirit. We must never overestimate our ability to live for Jesus. We must always be aware that we have a sinful nature. 
we must always guard ourselves. The Bible says what? Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil roams like a lion seek to and fro, seeking whom he may, may devour. But God desires none should perish. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. When we repent, there is a refreshing that comes from the Lord. I like what 2 Corinthians 7, verses 10 through 11. 2 Corinthians is a response from Paul from 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, Paul writes a big, what I call a nasty gram. He writes the Corinthian church a letter that says, you guys are a bunch of numbskulls. If there's anything you can do wrong, you found a way to do it wrong. If there's anything to do right, you found a way not to do it. You guys are in chaos and disorder. You're, I mean, you're, 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 the, you're the church that's the reason for my prayer life, not my praise life. That's what Paul said. I mean, he rips them a new one, so to speak. And so in 2 Corinthians, he's following up. In chapter 7, verse 10 and 11, he says, For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you, what cleaning, clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication, and all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. You know what Paul's saying here? He said, I rebuked you, and you repented, and now you, you're sorrowful for what you did, and it's producing the fire of God, the zeal of God. It's producing refreshing. It's producing the life of God in you. Amen. Amen. We had this situation about two weeks ago, and uh, you know, coaching girls basketball, seventh eighth grade girls, and many of the girls that I coach go to this church, and so I have to remember I'm their pastor. And I've I've found out the hard way in years past if you if you raise your voice, if you throw a basket, whatever you do, which is normal coaching, that's all they're going to remember the whole season. Ten years from now, that's all they're going to talk about. So very disciplined. You know, very, very, cut it, very, very sweet. Well, my, my partner coach, his girls were just having a bad practice and not, not performing to expectation. And but he let, he, he let them have it. Rah, 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 rah. And you know what happened? It instantly changed. They got better. Like that. What happened? He put a rebuke on them, and they responded. You know, I don't ever want to have to get in your face and blah, 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 blah. But at the same time, how many of y'all know, if we're going the wrong direction, don't you want someone to say, turn around? Don't walk toward destruction. Walk toward life. Don't walk toward sin. Walk toward righteousness. Don't walk toward the kingdom of darkness. Walk toward the kingdom of light. Amen. There was a time I had a great job in college. Uh, I started working as a waiter at a little Mexican restaurant called La Paloma. It's my favorite Mexican restaurant to this day. It's in Heath, Ohio. We just opened up a location in Columbus, and I was the waiter there and really enjoyed it. The, the owner was just a sweet, born-again Christian man. I'm still friends with him today. But it's just a father figure when I needed a father figure. And I remember I had a buddy, and we were making good money too. I mean, we were making good money. And I had a buddy who worked with me, and he just began to complain about our job. And I was like, okay, you know, all right, all right. And uh, well, then next thing I know, he says, hey, I'm leaving. I, I've got this job in sales, and it's, it's commission, but I'm going to make all this money, and all i got to do is this. And, 
It's just going to be, I want to make a ton of money. He said, you ought to come with me. You ought to come interview too. And he talked to me long enough and, you know, I said, okay, I'll go give it a try. So I went, interviewed, got the job. And I remember I gave, gave my boss the two week and he was a little, little floored, but okay, you know, if that's what you got to do, you know, I want the very best for you. And I remember going and trying to sell, and, and I was going to sell financial advice. Age 19 years old, selling financial advice. How many of y'all know if you take financial advice from a 19-year-old? <laughs> well, I made zero sales. Now, my commission was $400 a sale. Zero times 400 is zero. Well, my bank account went from positive from full to empty in just a few weeks. And I remember that was such a frustrating time, and I felt like God was mad at me. I felt like, like God, why are you letting me down? God, I, you know, I'm working hard. God, I'm, and I had to cold call people. I mean, it, I didn't know what I got myself into. It was, here's a phone book, call, and see what you can get. It was terrible. Absolutely terrible. And uh, anyway, after several weeks, I have no dollars left in my checking account, and I have bills to pay. I said, what should I do? What should I do? What should I do? You know what I did? I turned around. I went back to my boss at La Paloma, and I said, I have messed up. I should not have left. Would you take me back? He said, of course I'll take you back. And it wasn't long again. My bank account had money in it, praise God. You know. But you know what? It was just a very simple thing. I did something stupid. I walked away from something that was working. I walked away from the blessing. God had orchestrated that. Job. I'm under a man who cares about me, who's teaching me, who's fathering me, and, and, and putting all these things, and giving me opportunity. And then... I, I changed that for a job cold calling. How stupid can you get? <laughs> Apparently pretty stupid, huh? <laughs> and uh, I turned around. And it was blessing. If you ever find yourself, you ever find yourself, I've lost my fire. I've lost my zeal. I just don't. You know, I've had people tell me things like that before. I just don't seem to get it. I just, it's just not working for me. It's not, can, can I just share with you very lovingly and caringly, it's not God. And it ain't me. It's you. And what you don't want to hear is what you need to hear. And that is turn around. Repent, get the fire, but get the fire back in your life. Don't allow lukewarm embers to represent your faith in Jesus. Turn around. Number three, God's perception versus our perception. Verse 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Now look at verse 15. So he said to him, Oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. God shows up and says, You're a mighty man. You're a valor, valiant man. You're a man that's going to lead. You're a man that's going to save. And he's saying, where? I am, my clan is the weakest in Israel, and I'm the weakest of my clan. In other words, I'm the weakest, puniest, least likely to succeed individual in our whole nation. And right now our whole nation is kind of not in a good spot, so I'm like the worst in the world. Have y'all ever felt like that before? 
you know, everybody hates me. Nobody likes me. I'm going to go eat worms. Misery, despair, and all that other, well, I don't remember that song goes, but gloom and doom. We tend to focus on our failure and our human weakness, but God sees us through his eyes, and he sees it differently. Psalms 139 verse 14 says, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I guess, can we get that picture, Terry, up on the... This is, this is how we see ourselves and how God sees us. See, if we'll begin to look at ourselves how God sees us, that's what we'll see. And we tell, oh, I'm just this weak little thing. I'm just a little, I'm insignificant. I'm nothing. But God sees us as an image of himself. God sees you. You're one of his kids. Have y'all ever talked, got someone talking about their kids, how great their kids are? Yeah, sure. Why? Because that's programmed into our DNA because that's how God feels about us. He's proud of us. And we're sitting here thinking, oh, I'm weak, I'm, I can't do this, and I can't do that, and I'm not this, and I'm not that, and I'm not smarter, and I'm not this, and I'm not that. But God's saying, hey, yes, you are. God's saying, you're my boy, you're my girl. And last point today, verse 13, Gideon said to him, oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us, and where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Now Gideon's trying to pull a fast one here on God. Have y'all ever tried to pull a fast one on God like, God, I don't, I don't know why there's it's not working, God. I'm doing everything right. It must be you. That's what Gideon's doing right here. He's saying, hey, um, Lord, has, why have you forsaken us? Lord, this is your problem, not mine. Lord, why, why, why are you letting this happen? Oh, God, how could you let this happen? I know none of you all have ever prayed that prayer, ever. Oh, God, how could you let this happen? Gideon is not acknowledging the sin of Israel. He is not acknowledging, verse 1, that says Israel had sinned against the Lord. And he's trying to take all that misery, gloom, and despair and put that back on God. And God, you did this to us. Why have you forsaken us? Now, how many of all know God will never leave you nor forsake you? We do this today. We get ourselves into trouble. And then we say, where is God? We spend money we shouldn't have spent and say, why? God, help me in my finances. We, 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 we neglect ourselves spiritually and say, God, I just, I just feel, I don't feel the fire of God anymore. You know, or I'll tell you one, we, we, we just like we have a marriage seminar, you know, that's a good example of that. And there's so many people who, who, Man, if you would just come, you'd, your marriage would take off and it would be what you want it to be and you don't come because you're too busy because you think only people with bad marriages go to a marriage seminar and you don't want anybody to know. Gideon does ask a good question. Where are the miracles of our fathers? That's a question that I think is worth asking. Where are the miracles of our fathers? At least he's asking and not pretending. You remember last week when we talked about the woman who had the lost coin? She didn't pretend she didn't lose anything. She acknowledged she lost it, and she searched until she found it. We talked about the man cutting down the tree in 2 Kings chapter 6, and his axe head falls off into the water, and he doesn't pretend that he still has his axe head and keep trying to chop the tree down with no axe head. He stops and says, hey, we got a problem. I've lost my axe head. 
And I want you to know, ladies and gentlemen, one, one of the things that makes us Christians is it is a supernatural kingdom. The kingdom that we are a part of is not a natural kingdom. Jesus said, those who worship me will worship me in spirit and in truth. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. I do think sometimes we have to say, where are the miracles of our fathers? I'll tell you this. So, well, Pastor, I know all of this stuff. I know how bad the nation is. I know how people are getting abortions. People are homosexual. Well, guess what? You, you, you bring a homosexual person in who has AIDS, and you lay hands on them, and they get healed of AIDS. They're, they're, all of a sudden, they're interested in Jesus. Amen. Where are the miracles of my fathers? That's what Gideon prayed. He said, Lord, where, where are these miracles? I heard, I've, we've, all of our life, we've heard. We do these feasts. We heard about the Red Sea opening. We heard about Moses striking a rock and water gushing out. We heard about the manna from heaven. Where are these miracles? It's a good question. He, he's about to find out. God is a God of miracles and deliverance. And if we're not seeing it, we need to ask why. Amen. And next week we'll pick up there and find out the very next thing that God does with Gideon is he leads him to make a sacrifice of blood. Where are the miracles? Why am I so weak? Why are we this? Why have you... And all that negativity, all that I'm the weakest of the weak, oh, I'm, the, I'm, I'm this no good lonesome loser, I'm the born loser, all that is getting ready to go bye-bye at the shedding of blood. There it is right there, ladies. That's where we're going to get to. So next week, come back, we'll finish that out, thought out. And then we will get into uh, Gideon's 300 men versus the innumerable company of Midianites and how God showed up on their behalf. Amen. And today, God has shown up on our behalf. Who would have known from Cloverdale, Indiana, we would touch the world? But praise God, we're touching the world. And we're just getting started. We're just getting started. You're just getting warmed up. I mean, this is like the Indy 500, and it's just like they just said, start your engines, and we're just revving them up when they haven't even waved the flag yet. We're getting ready, though, bless the Lord. Amen? I bless you tonight. I bless you. I bless you. And I just declare over you tonight that you are on fire for the Lord. I declare over you tonight that you're in the will of God, that you're a champion for Christ, that you're a warrior for Christ. I declare over you that the fire of the Holy Ghost is in your belly. I declare over you that you're holy. I declare over you that you walk in righteousness, that God's favor is upon you. I like what the Bible says in Job over you, that you shall decree a thing and it shall be established. I just declare over you, you're blessed in your family. You're blessed when you go in. You're blessed when you go out. Everything you set your hands to is blessed. I declare over you tonight that you have a mouth that's anointed with the words of God to speak life and not death, that your tongue, that your mouth shall create people, a hunger in people to want to know Jesus. I declare you're full and overflowing with joy. You're full and overflowing with peace. That anxiety has no place in you. That fear, worry, and torment have no place in you. Bitterness has no place in you in the name of Jesus. That you walk in patience, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, humility, self-control, goodness. Oh my goodness. You walk in the fruit of the Spirit. You walk in the gifts of the Spirit. You're full of faith and miracles. You're full of joy and peace. I tell you what, you are the people of God. Amen. And you're blessed and you're His child. Amen. Praise God. That's who you are. So when you walk out of here tonight, you walk out of here with the fire of God and you just can't wait till you see somebody to tell them about the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. We already prayed. I'll just tell you. I can pray again. I'll tell you. 
I haven't stopped singing since Sunday night. My Sarah's like, Dad, will you please stop? But man, I tell you, we got, we got all full of the Holy Ghost on Sunday night. Well, God bless you tonight. We are dismissed. <laughs>